You've all come tonight because you know the Darfur region of Sudan is in flames. You know that for more than two years, cynical leaders have been working to enhance their power by using planes, bombs, soldiers, militia, and armed gangs to terrorize the civilian population of Darfur. More than a million and a half people have been driven from their homes. They've been held in camps that in some ways could be described in, as concentration camps because they can't get out of them. They've been denied access to food and water and shelter. Uh, many tens of thousands have been killed. Many crimes against humanity have been committed, including genocide, mass rape, and the systematic destruction of crops and livestock and villages. Hundreds of thousands are starving and many are dying. Now, if this all sounds familiar, it is indeed familiar. It's what happened exactly a decade ago, in some ways, in Rwanda, in Bosnia, and then in Kosovo, all crises which I saw firsthand when I tried to mobilize the U.S. government to take action when I was Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights in the Clinton administration. And I saw the world stand by in Rwanda and do nothing while 800,000 people were slaughtered in the fastest genocide in history. It later on took up the issue of justice in Rwanda, but the world did nothing to stop that genocide at the time. For more than two years, the world stood by in Bosnia as more than 200,000 people were killed in another genocide, which was finally stopped by international action led by the United States. And in Kosovo, the lessons of Rwanda and Bosnia at last, I believe, were learned, and 800,000 people who had been forced from their homes, Kosovar Albanians, were saved. In Darfur, the world seems to have forgotten these lessons, and I think that's why we're here tonight and we're going to discuss this. Uh, and again, the region burns while the world seems to do very little. Humanitarian agencies, which have heroically continued to work in, in Darfur, have struggled to bring food and water in. A few African countries, including Rwanda and Egypt, uh, have offered to send in troops and are sending in some troops to provide security, but no real assistance of any significant form, uh, at least in terms of trying to stop the genocide, is coming from the strongest governments in the world and, above all, the U.S. government. So tonight we are shining a spotlight on Darfur, and there is a basic question, and I think it's the question that we hope to be able to explore during this evening. What can be and must be done to stop this terrible human rights crisis? What is a plan of action, ultimately, that should be put before the leaders of the world? And to answer that question, we have a very distinguished panel of speakers, all of whom have had intense involvement with the crisis as activists, as analysts, and as travelers. Let me just briefly introduce them and then turn the program over to our moderator, our wonderful moderator, Gail Harris, who's seated at the end, uh, the frequent guest host of NPR's and WBUR's The Connection and other NPR programs who will ask our panelists to make very brief remarks and then engage with each other, uh, and she will moderate during that time, and then during the last half hour to engage directly with you and to take your questions. Our first panelist, seated next to Gail, is Alex DeWall. For the last two decades, Alex has been at the forefront of mobilizing international responses to the crises of famine, war, genocide, and AIDS in Sudan the Horn of Africa, and the Great Lakes region of Africa. He's written two books about Sudan and has lived and traveled extensively there. He is now Director of Justice Africa in London and is a fellow at the Global Equity Initiative at Harvard. Next to Alex is Dr. Jennifer Leaning, who directs the program on secure, human security and complex humanitarian emergencies at Harvard. Jennifer is a distinguished physician who has conducted humanitarian miss missions all over the world 
uh, most recently in Darfur last spring and early summer and has been a major media commentator on the crisis. Uh, she is a professor at the Harvard School of Public Health and an attending physician at the emergency room of Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, our third panelist is Eric Reeves. Eric is a professor of English at Smith College, who for the last five years has devoted his life outside of his work as a professor to pressing for an international response to genocide in Darfur. He publishes a newsletter on the crisis, has written extensively about it in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Nation, many other publications, and has testified before a number of congressional committees calling for U.S. action to stop the killing. Our fourth speaker is the Reverend Gloria White Hammond, one of Boston's most prominent community and humanitarian leaders. Gloria is the co-pastor of the Bethel AME Church, along with her husband, the Reverend Ray Hammond. Several times over the last four years, she has led coalitions of black ministers from Boston in slave redemption missions to Sudan, as a result of which over 9,000 slaves have been liberated. Reverend Gloria has a long history of community leadership, especially dealing with the needs of high-risk children and youth. And as a medical doctor, she has served as a medical missionary in South Africa, Cote d'Ivoire, and Botswana. Our cleanup speaker tonight is Bill Schultz, the Distinguished Executive Director of Amnesty International USA, one of the largest and most important human rights organizations in the world. Bill is one of our country's preeminent human rights leaders and has led missions on human rights issues all over the world, most recently to Darfur. Before coming to Amnesty in 1994, he was president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. He is an ordained minister and a leading authority on religious freedom and tolerance. Bill is the author of several books about human rights, including Our Own Best Interests, How Defending Human Rights Benefits Us All, and most recently, Tainted Legacy, 9-11, and the Ruin of Human Rights. So please join me in welcoming to the Kennedy Library stage Alex DeWall, Jennifer Leaning, Eric Reeves, Gloria White Hammond, Bill Schultz, and our moderator, Gail Harris. And I turn it over to you. Gail. We're going to begin with uh, about five minutes each, and this is going to be the challenge, number one. Trying to define this issue in five minutes is going to be extremely daunting. <coughs> uh, we've asked each of our panelists to make that attempt, and so I'm going to be standing here with whips and chains to, to try to make certain that happens, and we want to make certain that we have an opportunity to hear from you as well. So as they are speaking, if, if you're formulating a question, uh, keep it in mind, perhaps jot it down, and we will give you that opportunity a little bit later. But Alex, let's start with you. Thank you very much. And let me start by actually reminding ourselves that December 9th should be Genocide Day, because it was December 9, 1948, that the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide was passed unanimously by uh, the United Nations. So today is, is the 56th anniversary of, of, of passing that. Um, I lived in Darfur in the 1980s, and the people of Darfur taught me a great deal. Um, the very first thing that I learned, actually, in my very first day of, of field work studying the famine of 1984-85 was that just because you're starving doesn't mean you lose your sense of humor. I was, I was in a, a, a really desperate camp for displaced people where people were living on next to nothing. And it used to be, this was on the site of a camel market. And while I was sitting interviewing this desperately poor, very, very hungry old woman, these huge camel fleas the size of your fingernail were crawling up my legs and biting me. And they have a pretty ferocious bite, camel fleas do. And so I asked this old lady, how can you live here? You know, these things, don't they eat you? And she laughed and she, she said, no, 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 we eat them. Which is a pretty bad taste but joke, but not as bad taste as actually eating those sorts of things. But the remarkable thing about that drought famine was the extent to which people were able to survive under, on, on their own resilience, their own resources. And almost my last interview during my, um, the, the research I did in the 1980s was with a, a, a woman refugee driven out of southern Sudan. And, and I asked her a similar question about you know, her prospects, how she was surviving. And she said, leave it to us, we won't starve. We don't just starve. Someone has to force starvation upon us. 
And the verb to starve is transitive. It is not something that happens. It is something that people do to each other. Famine in Sudan is a crime and has been a crime for the last uh, 20 years. And the form of genocide that we are seeing in Darfur is, is I would argue, uh, a famine crime. Having said that, let me make the, the controversial statement that I think the international community is actually doing rather a lot about Sudan. It has got a rather unprecedented level of international diplomatic attention over the last year. Not all of it has been right, but it has got a lot of attention. And in particular, I want to commend the African Union, because I think its rather remarkable chairperson, Alpha Kunari, has basically got it right on Darfur. His calculation is this. First of all, um, pressure on the Sudan government is unlikely to yield radical changes. And his argument for that was that in the 1990s, there was much more pressure brought to bear than can ever be brought to bear today. There was, in fact, an undeclared war. This is something I've documented in a, in a recent book uh, on Islamism and its enemies in the Horn, whereby there were actually many thousands of troops from neighboring countries with their knife at the throat of the Khartoum regime in the late 1990s, undeclared. And that was what forced concessions out of Khartoum, um, expulsion of Osama bin Laden, etc., etc. It wasn't uh, action by the UN Security Council. So he says putting sanctions on these people is never going to recreate that sort of pressure. His second calculation is that um, regime change is not an option. Because what happens if, regime, if the regime changes? He says we have two options uh, that are likely to happen. One, the really radical Islamists, the people who were forced out of power when the Islamist movement split five years ago, they are the only organized force who will come back. And they will not solve the problem in Darfur, and moreover, they will reignite the war in southern Sudan, which is actually at the point of, of, of resolution as we speak. The other scenario, he says, is complete collapse. He attributes the crisis in Darfur uh, to an intersection of a collapse of governance in that region over 20 years and the, uh, the, the deliberate instigation um, of, of, of the government and indeed the rebels. And he said, we will see that sort of crisis unfolding across all of Sudan if there is no government at all. Any government, he says, almost any government is worse than no government. So what do we do to try and, and get Sudan out of this mess given that, we, that the African Union is not committed to regime change? Um, initially, when the African Union went into negotiating Darfur, they thought there would be a quick fix. They thought this problem was, the political problems could be fixed, and on the basis of that, then you could establish peace, protection, etc. It didn't work out that way. And it didn't work out that way because the crisis has unfolded in a way, in an escalating way that has meant that the two parties are not even clear why they are fighting. And in particular, the rebels are hopelessly disorganized in terms of their political agenda. So early attempts over the summer to get a quick political fix simply didn't work. And tomorrow, the African Union brings the sides together again in, for the third time in Abuja, in Nigeria, to try and move on this. And this time, they are being uh, much... Uh, more realistic. They don't expect any settlement to come out of these talks. What they expect is the foundation for an agenda for negotiating a political settlement over the coming months. So in the light of that modest expectation, the strategy has reverted to uh, one of securing the North-South peace, this peace that has been painstakingly negotiated over the last two and a half years. Um, and using that as a foundation for trying to uh, address the problems in Darfur. That is a strategy that was roundly criticized in the Washington Post editorial this morning, and I think wrongly so. And I think wrongly so because it is um, an imperfect strategy. It is not going to deliver a rapid solution, but it is the only strategy under current circumstances that can deliver a solution. Meanwhile, the immediate challenge is stabilizing Darfur in terms of security, providing the troops on the ground, the African Union troops, with the right mandate, the right plan of action, um, the right logistical backup, and getting the parties, including the rebels, to agree to, um, to stick to the agreements that they have already made. Let me stop at that point. Excellent. A good place indeed. Jennifer. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, the, the crisis in Sudan is, uh, in Darfur, is basically one whereby large populations of civilians are still being hunted down by uh, Arab militiamen and forces of the Sudanese government. It's still happening. 
We have been watching this unfold since February of 2003. In April of 2004, uh, another anniversary being important, the 10-year anniversary of the Rwanda genocide, a number of human rights and humanitarian groups, some had, having been active in the field in Darfur for months, some just getting activated, began to raise public awareness of the unfolding disaster that was uh, befalling the people of Darfur. And a number of us began to say, what are we seeing over there? It's a very remote part of the world, very hard to get good news from it, extremely hard to get good numbers out, um, a highly complicated political background. Is there any way we can get a sense of what's going on and begin to frame that sense in a way that is actionable for U.S. public and U.S. policymakers. So on behalf of Physicians for Human Rights, I and a colleague of mine, John Heffernan, went in uh, late May and early June to the Chad-Darfur border. Human rights people could not get into Darfur via Khartoum because the Sudanese government was uh, in control of issuing visas and would not have allowed us to get in. And at that point, they were also still markedly blocking access for even simple humanitarian action, that is the delivery of food and water and shelter coming in uh, from Khartoum and other points of uh, dispersal throughout Sudan. So it was really difficult uh, within Sudan for humanitarian access, let alone uh, a human rights investigation. So our option was to go along the border of Chad, where at that point about 200,000 refugees had fled from Darfur into Chad, which is the neighboring country to the west, seeking um, protection and safety and uh, fleeing from the uh, Arab militia and, and to some extent the government of forces of Sudan. We went the north-south boundary area. It's a vast area, very difficult uh, to traverse by um, four-wheel drive vehicle, extraordinarily poor and dry. It was just in advance of the rainy season. Uh, bleak conditions even for the few people in Chad that lived there and then it was becoming much more difficult. Uh, because they were trying to absorb and take care of the 200,000 people that were coming from Darfur. <clears throat> the stories we heard as we moved up and down from camp to camp or from the border areas where the humanitarian community had been slow to resettle people, so they were still right on the border subject to the attack from the Janjui, the Arab militia coming in from uh, Darfur. The stories were um, remarkably consistent and um, filled with uh, jeopardy and pain. The attacks usually occurred in the morning. The Janjaweed would come on the village. You might see a government plane circling overhead earlier. There would be um, the sort of cracking of plates and the running out of houses as people were dispersed from the morning prayers or, prayers or still waking up. Um, the Janjaweed and the military forces would start from one end of the village, go to the other, um, kill whatever men they could find or boys, rape the women, uh, steal the cattle and the camels, kill all the other small animals, destroy the irrigation works, burn down the gran granaries, burn all of the buildings, contaminate the wells with um, the carcasses of animals or to some extent the bodies of human beings, and then engage in hot pursuit by horseback, vehicle, or plane across the very open terrain as the people were fleeing and going to the bush, a hill, another village. And then they often would come back and finish the job in that village, leaving a complete rubble, scorched earth, impossible to um, reconstruct scene um, at the site of that village. And this is how they were moving across Darfur, north, west, and south. Every family we spoke to, and the families were usually female-headed with a couple of adolescent or younger women and some small kids, clustering the scrawniest of goats uh, because they this is their last chance for livelihood is to hold on to their livestock. Every family we spoke to had at the time of the attack of their village um, lost at least five members of their extended family. The people were numb, completely dignified, very civilized, very contained, and still shocked with what had befallen them. And although we did not interview all 200,000, we moved fast enough and saw a number of them um, across various settings and various tribal groups to come back with the statement that what we think we were seeing based on a qualitative but fairly seasoned assessment of interviews of people who have suffered trauma in war, we see a pattern of attack that is designed to uh, kill a large number of people but much more importantly um, eliminate people's capacity to live on the land 
destroy livelihood, destroy evidence that they live there, and create such fear among the populace that they might never go back unless major intervention could be launched from the side of the international community. And on that basis, in terms of our reading of the Genocide Convention, and it's instructive that Alex began by noting this anniversary date, on our reading of the Genocide Convention, signed in 1948, and the United States took long to sign it, they signed it in 1986, there is um, a clause there where most people who have been thinking about genocide uh, might not rest and define genocide per se, but there is a clause that says the uh, attempt to destroy the physical conditions of life that make it possible for a group to sustain itself, that action itself constitutes genocide. And the land and the livelihood is destroyed, and then what we've seen <coughs> after these attacks is the deliberate obstruction of the government of Sudan from uh, all fronts of any humanitarian aid to be delivered to the population under considerable pressure, including um, major efforts on the part of the United States. That obstruction of access has been eased over the summer. So there are now claims that perhaps 60% of the population that is displaced within Darfur is getting some aid. The point being, we are unsure of the death rate, but we think it is an, on the order of um, scores of thousands, upwards of 100,000 to perhaps 300,000, and we can go into the details of the estimates. We think that there are, we know there are 200,000 refugees and somewhere between one and a half and two million people internally displaced. Over half the population of Darfur dead or displaced and uh, dislocated from their lives and livelihood. This is a colossal undertaking to redress, but the first steps are to stabilize, I agree with Alex, introduce more humanitarian aid, much higher levels of security, augment the capacity of the African Union, and create a stand down so that the killing and destruction stops. And then we can begin to think through the political process of creating stability there and the chance of return and reparation. Thank you, Jennifer. Eric. I'd like to offer several broader generalizations of the crisis in Darfur, rather different from Alex's and suggest something of what I see as the ominous trajectory of this catastrophe. Let me say first that I believe the debate about whether or not ethnically animated human destruction in Darfur rises to the level of genocide is over. Those remaining agnostics have, to date, presented no compelling arguments about why we should doubt either genocidal intent on the part of the Khartoum regime or that a quantitative threshold for genocide has been crossed. Indeed, the scale of the catastrophe proceeding from the deliberate destruction of non-Arab or African tribal populations in Darfur is barely comprehensible. UN data suggests that there are 2.5 million people displaced within Darfur and into Chad, and that approximately 3 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. My own research, which has sought to canvas all extant literature and data bearing on global mortality in Darfur, suggests that well over 300,000 lives have already been lost. For those interested, I brought copies of the most recent, the ninth iteration of this effort to quantify genocide in Darfur. The current global mortality rate is roughly 30,000 per month and climbing. Humanitarian capacity is less than half what is needed for the current phase of the crisis and dire forecasts from the ICRC and others about food availability in early 2005 suggests that the crude mortality rate will increase rapidly. The World Food Program reached 175,000 fewer people in October than in September and fell short of its target of 2 million people by 900,000. Most of those who received any food received only flour or grain, no oil or pulses. This diet cannot sustain human life. In camps to which there is humanitarian access, fewer than half the people have clean water or sanitary facilities. Disease within badly weakened populations will take an ever greater toll in coming months. The humanitarian intervention that was dictated by genocidal realities a year ago is nowhere in sight. The UN Security Council is paralyzed and seems content with passing increasingly meaningless resolutions. This has had the, this has had the effect of emboldening the National Islamic Front regime in Khartoum. 
One recent but telling sign of this is the brazen expulsion of the head of country operations for Oxfam International. Oxfam had been harshly critical of the most recent Security Council resolution and is being punished for its outspokenness by a regime that feels confident there will be no consequences. UN political leadership, Kofi Annan, Jan Prank, Karen Prendergast, is moving toward a policy of what I would call moral equivalence between the Darfuri insurgents and the genocidaire in Khartoum. This is especially conspicuous in recent statements by Annan, December 3rd, and Prendergast, December 7th, to the Security Council about the nature of recent violence, particularly in the Tawila area of North Darfur. <coughs> UN diplomatic strategy has lurched from a policy of making demands of Khartoum preeminently that it disarm the Janjaweed to a policy of offering financial inducements if the regime will only complete the long-deferred North-South peace agreement in Naivasha, Kenya. Seeing that apparent progress or nominal engagement in the Naivasha process works to mute international criticism of its behavior in Darfur, the regime will certainly string out negotiations as long as possible, a strategy that has served exceedingly well over the past year. The future in Darfur looks ghastly beyond description. We're fortunate to have Alex DeWall among us, one of the few people knowledgeable enough to suggest ways in which Darfuri society can be put back together. It will be an enormously difficult task. Ethnic identities have become much more salient, indeed inflamed, than at any time in Darfur's history, and most of the Darfuris I speak with declare they can't imagine how Arabs and Africans can live together again. In the near term, without massive humanitarian intervention supported by all necessary military resources, we may expect the following. Rapidly growing insecurity, which will derive primarily from Khartoum's disproportional violation of a merely notional ceasefire. A consequent disastrous attenuation of humanitarian reach. Dramatically increasing mortality in the rural populations that are already beyond humanitarian aid. The African Union forces presently deploying will be overwhelmed by an increasingly difficult security environment, and even when fully deployed, will be very badly undermanned and under-equipped. And the Janjaweed militia, which is not a party to either the April 8th ceasefire or the November 9th reiteration of ceasefire terms in Abuja, will continue to be unconstrained, indeed supported by Khartoum. Genocide by attrition will continue for the foreseeable future, and as many as one million people may eventually die as a direct result of actions by Khartoum and the Janjaweed over the past 22 months of conflict. Thank you, Eric. Uh, we turn now to Gloria. Thank you. Um, first of all, it's, uh, it's really a, a pleasure to be in a room with this many people who are interested in Sudan. For those of us who've uh, been caring about Sudan for a while. It's, um, it's, it's, it's heartening to see you in the house tonight. Uh, I just want to open with a, a quote that has been uh, one of my, um, one of my uh, encouragements as I've been involved with Sudan now for uh, looking at it for about the last 10 years and having traveled to it now six times in the last uh, three and a half years. This quote is from uh, Henri Dunant, who's the founder of the International Committee of the Red Cross, and it reads, last of all, in an age when we hear so much of progress in civilization, is it not a matter of urgency, since unhappily we cannot always avoid wars to press forward in a human and truly civilized spirit the attempt to prevent, or at least to alleviate the horrors of war? Uh, much of my effort, again, in the last three and a half years has been to um, uh, to alleviate the horrors of war, primarily in southern Sudan, working with uh, women. And it's so often the case, the, the real victims of uh, war are the women and the children. Uh, and so I have, um, uh, with a small group of women, have a purpose to uh, serve as channels of hope for women in southern Sudan. Again, my interest goes back. Um, to 1995, and, and I, I don't know if this is a crowd that remembers when the story about uh, slavery in Sudan uh, broke, uh, primarily by a reporter uh, who was then at the Boston Phoenix. Um, 
I made my first trip in July 2001 because I was interested in looking at this issue under the auspices of a group based here in Boston, the American Anti-Slavery Group, a group that's based in Zurich, uh, Christian Solidarity International. They were involved in a what is certainly a controversial uh, program of slave redemption. And my effort was simply to go and to look and to be able to talk <coughs> with some of the people who were returning from, uh, from the north where they had been enslaved and um, subsequently to see what I could do. Um, having, with these women returning, what would be next for them? How would they be integrated into their villages? Uh, what could a group of American women do to support them in their efforts to restore the communities? Uh, again, I've, I've been there now um, six times. Um, and um, our first uh, uh, effort was simply to talk with women, just to tell me what you've been through. Uh, and what I've appreciated is what I hope uh, you all are appreciating just by looking at the news is that this is not simply a matter of war. It's about war. It's about rape. It's about, um, for women who are in the North, forced female circumcision. It's about beatings and burnings and stabbings of every kind. Um, and it is an unconscionable uh, tragedy what women and children uh, have um, have suffered. Um, when what we have done, and, and with uh, with their uh, prompting, is supported them by uh, establishing a couple of microeconomic. Uh, development projects. We uh, bought two grinding mills, which are now uh, in two different villages. Uh, women will spend six to eight hours a day preparing a meal. Oh my God! Um, and uh, with the grinding mills, they're able to do that work in less than half an hour. It is a small thing, but it's a significant thing, um, in that it now allows women to uh, participate in literacy programs. And uh, when we were in the village in July, one gentleman stood up and said how much he appreciated our efforts because. Um, he said, and uh, before this, his wife used to be grouchy. Now, after being able to uh, uh, have her meals prepared in less than half an hour, his marriage was much improved. So he thanked us for the contribution that we made to his life. And then young girls saying that finally they were able to get back to school. We have um, also supported a girls' school, a, a girls' school with 135 little girls. And we made our trip there and uh, met the girls. They sang a song which roughly translates as, it is now our time to be in charge. So these are certainly examples of tremendous girl power. We've also uh, developed an HIV AIDS project. A year and a half ago, we brought a physician who's from southern Sudan who uh, uh, has runs a, a very busy clinic in uh, southern Sudan. We brought him here, and he served as a visiting scholar at the B.I. Deaconess Hospital, developed a very rudimentary um, uh, effort to address the issue of HIV and AIDS. And as we, uh, we haven't talked about that tonight, but let me just tell you that uh, what people on the ground understand is that their enemy well, once um, uh, our concern is that once this peace treaty is signed and we hope that that'll come we've had many deadlines and and all kinds of versions of deadlines but if in fact this next one obtains then perhaps by the beginning of the year there will be peace what we'll understand is that refugees will be coming back into the country and our uh, anxiety is that they will bring their HIV with them and so that the enemy that the government of Sudan represents is nothing like the enemy that uh, HIV AIDS represents and so people are also beginning to think about that and poised to address that. Um, we will be going into Sudan, into Darfur in January. There will be a group of six women. And again, our effort is simply to talk with women, to find out what we can do um, to support them, not only in the, in the effort to survive, and that's important. They need food, they need water, they need uh, protection. But um, as one woman said, we have spent many years now experiencing war and death and dying. Thank you for coming alongside to facilitate life and living. And so our effort is to hear what they need, um, to whether it be literacy training, whether it be uh, development around uh, uh, peacemaking activities or women's health issues. Uh, again, our effort is to simply support them in, in whatever the next phase of their life will be. We know that these, con these uh, uh, excuse me, they are not concentration camps. But they sound, if you've, if you've heard the accounts, they very much sound like they could be. But these refugee camps, at this point, the reality is, is that they are going to be in place for a while. And um, there is, as you've heard, there's really no place for women and children to go back to. And so given that reality, our effort as a group of women from Boston is to see what we can do to support them in, in thriving as best they can in the context of these refugee camps. We, um, my... 
my biggest reason in going back is because I feel like I, I simply can no longer, I no longer can countenance the systematic abuse and victimization of women and children as pawns in war games. I will not do that anymore. And, um, and I, again, I appreciate your presence here tonight because it says to me that you are people of like-minded faith. And so, um, so while we're in the midst of doing all the advocacy and putting the pressure on, uh, on the powers to be, that, that be that to go beyond functional hand-wringing and, and, and complicity, um, my commitment is to go forth and do something on the ground to keep hope alive in a very tangible way for, um, for our women, our sisters, who at this point are um, either victims in southern Sudan or victims in Darfur, and appreciate uh, your support and your encouragement by simply showing up to be here. And hopefully we'll be, end up uh, agreeing to do even more. Thank you. Thank you, Gloria. Bill. Is that an Arab tribe or an African tribe? I asked the 300-pound chief of police of South Darfur province as we watched a festival of dance performed by dozens of tribes from the region. I have no idea, he said. I can never tell them apart. Let me check with the governor. That was just one of many ironies that I encountered as I participated earlier this fall in the first authorized visit by an international human rights organization to Sudan since the fighting began in February 2003. Our mission confirmed much of what we know. I'm not going to tell you what you know, what we all know. It also pointed up one paradox after another, symbolized perhaps by the angry Sudanese defense minister who pounded the table, denounced amnesty at the top of his lungs, and then his cell phone went off. And I recognized the ringtone. It was Mary Had a Little Lamb. But then this is a government, all but one of whose members of the National Commission on Women are males, the chair of whom announced that women in Darfur are too stupid to understand the difference between the Arabic word for the rape and the Arabic word for forced robbery. And rapes are not going on in Darfur, he said. Islamic men do not rape. For once, the United States has played a a largely positive role, if a tardy one here, but so tarnished is our image and so shaky our moral credibility that even our allies in Darfur uh, question our motives. One European aid worker said to me, after Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib, the Sudanese have nothing to fear from America's censure. A Sudanese official scoffed defiantly, your State Department says there are mass graves in Darfur, that it's genocide, but your State Department said that there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And yet, in late September at least, the Sudanese government obviously feared what appeared to be America's resolve. You will surely bomb us, they told me, just as you bombed Iraq. The intervening months, I think, have proven just how hollow uh, that alleged threat was. And the victims are not just Sudanese. They are all of Africa as well. For as we've heard earlier on the panel, the Darfur crisis has presented the African Union with an opportunity to demonstrate its willingness to intervene in the affairs of a sovereign state, and the African Union has accepted that challenge. But the international community has failed to provide the African Union with the resources to do its job. And in that respect, it's failed not only the people of Darfur, but Africa itself. For when the next crisis erupts, who will believe that the African Union is more than a paper tiger? Uh, the African Union, 300 troops to cover a country the size of uh, France, a region the size of France, one helicopter to cover all of South Darfur province. Of course, the crisis of Darfur reflects not just a regional brawl, but the fruits of a totally corrupt regime. On 30 minutes' notice, we were admitted to the National Security Prison in South Darfur, where we met with lawyers who had been imprisoned for the crime of trying to seek redress for their clients, redress from Janjaweed rape and murder through the legal system rather than at the point of a rifle. The moment they had agreed to take the cases of African tribal clients, they were tossed into prison. But then this is a government that makes a paradox a way of life. We met a man who had been kidnapped by the rebels and then released found his way back to town, reported his kidnapping to the police, 
and was promptly charged by the police with the crime of having made contact with the rebels. So what can we do about this? Because, of course, the people who are suffering or are, as usual, all of those caught in the middle who had virtually nothing to begin with and now have even less. While the Congressional Black Caucus was getting arrested, while George Bush was getting reelected, uh, those people stole for 15 minutes the world's attention. But now uh, that uh, world has lapsed back into a kind of lassitude. What can we do? First, what can the United States government do? First, it can continue to send high-level officials to, to Sudan. It is symbolic, but it is important. And the first thing that Condoleezza Rice should do at her confirmation hearings is to announce that the first place she will go, once confirmed as Secretary of State, is Sudan. Uh, secondly, the United States, which has already supplied some assistance to the African Union, should do everything it can to pressure the EU and other <coughs> supplier nations to provide the African Union with the resources it needs, with communication equipment, with helicopters, with jeeps. Third, the United States should do what it can to put pressure on arms suppliers to the Sudanese government, not just arms suppliers to the forces at war in Darfur directly, but arms supplies to the Sudanese government itself, the Chinese, the Russians, our so-called allies in the war on terror. Third, fourth, we should engage in conversations with the Arab League, a very important player which has been noticeably silent on this issue. Fifth, we should at least take seriously the option of oil sanctions. Uh, and sixth, we should push the United Nations Commission, which is allegedly reflecting upon this question of genocide, to make its decision quickly. And of course, seventh and finally, we should provide and urge our allies to provide the kind of true humanitarian assistance that are needed, including, for example, to the women and families of Darfur with the kind of therapeutic resources they need to deal with the trauma of massive numbers of rape and murders of their families. Let me just conclude with this thought. You know, we often hear uh, proudly sloganized uh, at every opportunity the two words, never again. Well, were we to draw analogies between Darfur today and the Holocaust, we would by now in Darfur be way past the Wannsee Conference. We would be way past the Kristallnacht. We would we be way past the initial deportations, way past SS thuggery, way past the holding camps, way past the first 40,000 deaths. About the only thing that remains in Darfur is full-scale Auschwitz. And until we stop this carnage, anyone, any one of us who has shouted never again ought to be too embarrassed to ever shout it again. Thank you, Bill. And thank you all. Some of you have touched on this. I, I wonder if we can explore it a bit more, and, and that is the question uh, leading to the what needs to be done. Uh, is there a tipping point here? Because some thought that once Congress declared this to be, in fact, genocide, once Colin Powell declared it to be genocide, that perhaps then that would be the moment in which something substantive happened. And yet here we are, uh, these weeks later, with uh, certainly some, some bleak stories that we've heard just this evening. Uh, if that's not the tipping point, what is? What can we look for? I think we might note that accompanying Colin Powell's genocide determination was the following statement, and I quote, in fact, nothing new follows from this genocide determination. What he meant by nothing new is that nothing followed from the U.S. genocide determination other than to refer that genocide, uh, genocide determination to an obviously paralyzed U.N. Security Council, paralyzed primarily because of China. China is a net importer of oil. It imports oil at a very, very uh, high rate, and that growth increases by 10 percent a year. It views southern Sudan as its premier, rightly as its premier source of offshore oil, at least that it controls, and looks at Sudan almost exclusively through the lens of petroleum needs. After the second weaker UN Security Council resolution 
of September 18th, the Chinese permanent ambassador to the United Nations declared quite publicly, if there's another resolution with any threat of sanctions, we will veto it. End of statement. Um, we've had the crisis, the conflict, and the mass killing in Darfur uh, described as genocide, and I believe that's correct. I think the comparison with Rwanda and the Holocaust is less exact than the comparison with southern Sudan and Nuba Mountains. I mean, um, a colleague of mine in London, John Ryle, in, in response to, I forget who it was, who had called uh, Darfur, Rwanda slowed down, said, no, this is actually southern Sudan speeded up. Mm -hmm. And I think if we look at, um, at, at Darfur through that lens, a number of important things arise. The first is that actually what we've seen in what is happening in Darfur is, is, is uniquely horrible. Um, but you, comparably nasty things have happened <coughs> on several occasions in the last 15 or so years in other parts of Sudan. In, 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 I, I won't go into the list, but there are at least three episodes. And the interesting um, conclusion that one can draw from that is, um, or rather one can draw two radically different conclusions. One is that the, this is a repeated moral failing. The world should have intervened to stop the, the massacres in Barak Ghazal in the late 1980s or the genocide in the Nuba Mountains in the early 1990s. Alternatively, you can draw the conclusion, and this is the conclusion that is being drawn by the diplomatic community, that the, 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 the route to solving this is through a negotiated settlement because the actual practicality of intervening militarily to stop it with, with international forces is, 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 is so remote. Um, and one, one interesting little uh, discussion that was had was about the difficulty that arose when the UN Security Council asked the Sudan government to, to disarm the Janjaweed within 30 days. And the, when the um, UN envoy, Jan Pronk, went to, went to Sudan, he was ra widely, roundly criticized for, for sort of walking back on that commitment, saying, um, let's not have that commitment. Let's have a, let's have a more, a, a much watered down commitment. And there, and, and there are arguments on both sides. The argument on his side is that the government was actually being asked to do something it couldn't do. The fact being that the uh, militias, um, the so-called Janjaweed, I, mean, I don't terribly like using the term because it means different things to different people, are much better armed than the government forces there. Um, until the, um, in the first six months of the rebellion, the government lost 90% of the military engagements in, in Darfur. It was only when it used the militia that it actually uh, stopped the rebellion in its tracks. Um, and the government is not in a position whereby it simply can go and do this. It, can, it, it cannot actually um, forcibly disarm the Janjaweed. It can only do this um, by, uh, by, by consent. And yes, in an ideal world, there would be a, an international military intervention with you know, 50 or 100,000 international special forces would parachute into Darfur and would disarm these people. But if, if that is not going to happen, and I, frankly, I don't think it is going to happen, we, we have to look at the second best options. And the second best option is coming to an overall framework negotiated settlement, which is going to take a little time, and trying to stabilize the, the human suffering in, in, in the meantime. Jennifer, <clears throat> the, uh, it may not be so obvious to you uh, in the room why a full force military intervention of 50 or 60,000 troops is not possible. Uh, and that would be very interesting to hear from you if some of you have that question and we could get into that detail. Those of us who have um, been very active in ag advocacy at the UN and, and the US governmental levels, and, and it's gotten very high because the Bush administration is, is deeply interested in resolving this. It's a very important part of the Bush administration's agenda here. Uh, it may have fallen off the radar in the last couple of months, but it, it essentially, um, in high places, they do care. The head of USAID, the three um, more senior people in USAID right under him, very senior people in the State Department, very high people in the Office of Management and Budget, budget people in the Executive Office of the President. Um, and <clears throat> we in PHR and a number of us around on this room um, on the panel side have been in touch with them, and there's been many other high-level <coughs> contacts. The problem is the United States doesn't have any throw weight. Uh, 
it's extremely important to realize that um, we are deeply handicapped politically and diplomatically by our having entered Iraq on terms that the UN and the international community consider, if not illegitimate, at least um, extraordinarily um, preemptory and uh, unthought out, <clears throat> and definitely unilateral. And there is um, no willingness to follow the U.S. lead um, and no willingness to follow the U.S. analysis. One of the issues um, that is fascinating at, at a subtext level, below, slightly below the political radar, is that those of us who have been calling it genocide have not been saying one way or the other that that therefore forces a military intervention. The Genocide Convention merely says that once you determine uh, genocide is taking place, a state may call upon the UN and one of its um, organs to take action. That's the language in the Genocide Convention. The two things that a state is required to do if it makes a determination of genocide are um, one, to um, permit extradition, extradition from its country uh, of uh, those people who have been charged with genocidal action by another country. And uh, the, the other is to make sure that um, well, our laws are compatible with um, all opposition to genocide, but there isn't um, an action that is required of us. The problem is that the Europeans, at the civil society level and the governmental level, have resisted calling this genocide. There may be very principled reasons and very principled um, empirical um, basis for that resistance, but there's also a high political resistance to taking any lead from the United States. And it's, I think it's really important that we in America realize the consequences of the Iraq war in terms of um, the failure to save the people in Darfur. There is a quite close, tight linkage. And one other point I'd like to make, <clears throat> if that is the case, and uh, if also there are some very important reasons why regime change, as Alex has said, uh, seems unwise given how complex Sudan is and the ramifying politics of that action, then we are back to this humanitarian aid, security protection angle with all of that resting on the very tiny wheels of the African Union. And it is a fundamentally flawed, very difficult place to be, particularly from the perspective of the, those who are still dying and languishing in Darfur. So a very important issue is to keep the pressure on so that we do not permit, we, the United States, we can do this diplomatically and politically, we do not permit the ongoing corrupt uh, shenanigans of the Sudanese government, and I would say certain representatives from the UN to continue. These lapsed deadlines, this long period of time, Eric is the one who's been saying for months, time is on the side of the Sudanese government. Time is not on the side of the people of Darfur. And there are some of us who feel that, as you said, um, Bill, we are well into an accomplished genocide here. There are others who feel that the resilience of these people is such that there will be a capacity to come back, regardless. Uh, to allow more time to lapse without action on the ground is uh, going to be a calamity. Yes, Bill. Uh, Gail, I just wanted to, to respond briefly to uh, what Alex said about the government. I, I certainly agree that this is a weak government. It's a divided government. It's not a government that unilaterally can disarm or stop the Janjaweed or the militias from doing what they're doing, but it certainly can do a great deal more than it's doing. It can do something. It can stop supplying them arms, for example. It can stop collaborating with the bombings and the attacks. It can stop tilting toward the militia, denying and excusing militia atrocities. It can stop denying and excusing rapes by the militias. It's important, I think, to remember that that we talk of the militia, but as Alex knows better than any of us, it's really militias. There are many different militias here. And the other thing the Sudanese government is it can prosecute one person. It hasn't prosecuted a single person on the so-called Janjaweed side of the conflict. So there is at least some, uh, there are at least some things that the government can do. And while I certainly agree that the solution to this will need to be a negotiated one and not a military one, I think that the fact that it has to be a negotiated one reinforces the, the point a number of us had made about the importance of the African Union being fully supplied. Because once the negotiation is successful, if it ever is, there are going to have to be troops on the ground 
that enforce whatever that solution is going to be. And those troops are not going to be American troops. They shouldn't be American troops, as Jennifer has just said. Uh, they are not going to be, in, I suspect, in great number European Union troops. Who are they going to be? If they're going to be anyone, they're going to be African Union troops. I, I think one of the reasons for the, at least for my being pessimistic about uh, uh, this government is, is again, this, the, the strategy that we're seeing in Darfur is, as we all know, it's not new. I and mean, this is more than 20 years ago, the very same strategy of the government uh, colluding with the militia to go into the governments, to, the, into the villages, destroy the villages, take the women, et cetera. All of this is so familiar. And, uh, and in the last 20 plus years, they certainly have not, uh, have, have not done anything to arrest that process. I, I, I find myself saying that, at least in Sudan, um, this is a place where denial is not just a river. It is, in fact, what this government does and does so well. Um, one of my questions, uh, there, there certainly has been a, a more recent um, suggestion that perhaps it's time for a regime change at the United Nations, <coughs> and I would be interested in getting the comments of some of my fellow panelists about making a change. Actually, before we do that, let me, let me ask you as well. Jennifer mentioned uh, the, the need to keep up pressure. And I wonder if you'd speak, Gloria, uh, for just a moment about the role of the American evangelical community in achieving change. Oh, it, it, you're in Sudan? Yes. OK, OK. I thought you were going to talk about this most recent election. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we're focusing yes, on that's, Sudan. Yes, that's right. No, let's do Sudan. Tempting as it is. <laughs> OK, I'm here. Um, well, certainly, I think in terms of southern Sudan, I uh, particularly um, uh, the evangelical community has been very, very, uh, very active in terms of uh, uh, in terms of southern Sudan, primarily in terms of this whole issue of the, the slavery and, uh, and doing more to recognize slavery and to uh, at least do some work around abolition of slavery in southern Sudan. And I think that's been important. It certainly has by no means been enough, but it certainly it has been a, an important place to begin. And, um, and, and, and I, I want to think that one of the reasons that um, there has been some movement even to, to acknowledge the fact that Darfur exists is the fact that there's been a, a general uh, uh, groundswell on the ground here in America, and I, I want to think that part of that is driven by the the, the evangelical church movement um, to keep this issue alive. Now there is much, much, much more that needs to be done, uh, but there's. Uh, I want to say that part of the credit goes to the uh, to the evangelical church movement. I also want to ask a, a practical question, which is we now have all these people who have been displaced, and as uh, I, yes, Gloria spoke to about uh, the, the scorched earth, earth policy, as, as did Jennifer. Um, where could they go? Let's say the problem was solved tomorrow. What happens to these people? They go back, their villages, the wells have truly been, been contaminated, have been poisoned, their fields are, are uh, you know, who even knows who owns the land anymore? Yeah. Where could these people go? Well, I think one of the answers is they do not have any place to go. Uh, the destruction has been so complete. A typical village destruction entails not simply the killing of primarily men and boys, the raping of girls and women, girls as young as eight, but the destruction of villages in the form of dwellings, water supplies, irrigation systems, Food, food stocks, seed stocks, agricultural implements, mosques are burned, Qurans are defecated, fruit trees are cut down. But even more important than the fact that they would have nothing to return to, these people have no security. Mm -hmm. They would go in any event with nothing if they had security, but they don't have security. And the people in the rural areas, and one thing we have not touched on yet, is the vast number of people who are really quite beyond humanitarian aid reach now. The numbers range between half a million and a million. These people are slowly starving. Uh, Alex certainly knows better than any of the superb coping skills of these people. Uh, he observed it firsthand, uh, 1984, 1985, in the famine. But they cannot deploy these coping skills if insecurity reigns. So what we have to have is a, I would argue, to go back to the issue of uh, an intervening force, we need to look at the security tasks in understanding the nature of this intervening force. It has to protect the camps, 
the camp environs. It has to ensure that women leaving the camps to collect firewood are not raped by the Janjaweed. It needs to protect humanitarian workers who are operating under intolerable risk. It needs to create safe corridors for humanitarian convoys. It needs to protect people who desire to return to uh, their villages or the former sites of their villages. And it certainly needs to, if not disarm, at least neutralize militarily the Janjaweed. This is something that is simply far beyond the capabilities of the African Union, and we do the African Union no service by not acknowledging this. This is a first deployment by the African uh, Peace and Security Commission, and it comes three to four years before they plan to deploy. Romeo Dallaire in a recent JFK uh, School of Government uh, presentation argued that it would take 44,000 NATO quality troops to address these various security issues. That's a consensus figure among the military experts I've talked with. But that's just to provide security and to augment uh, the efficiency of humanitarian aid delivery, most of which is now being, in, at least in food, being flown in, flying food in from Nyala, uh, into Nyala from um, El Obeid is four to five times as expensive as trucking it in or taking it in by rail. We have acute security problems right now that make it impossible for people to survive in rural areas or to return to rural areas or indeed even to survive in the camps. Gail, your question is, is a profoundly important one. Eric says they have nowhere to go, but the reality is they're going to go somewhere and, and the vast majority of them are going to stay in Sudan in one place or another. And they're going to be in an enormously... A difficult situation there for the many reasons that he just he has just eloquently described and one of the unspoken aspects of this crisis or very little spoken is that even if we do resolve the conflict itself the war itself and uh, establish security we will then be faced with an enormous humanitarian challenge billions and billions of dollars and the great danger is that if the world a world does manage, the international community does manage to resolve this conflict, that then everyone will assume that the problem is taken care of. And that's when the real crisis may set in and the real dying, uh, even beyond what we're seeing now, may occur. I want to put out one more question to, to the panelists and, and invite those of you who have questions and comments. Why don't you start stepping toward the microphone? We have one right here in the central aisle. <laughs> And we'll be happy to hear from you in, in just a moment. Um, Alex, you were about to add to that comment first. I, I, was, I was just going to say we mustn't underestimate the, the, the local resources in terms of, of, of return, rehabilitation, and, 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 and the construction or reconstruction of some sort of um, social fabric. And I think the, the point about security is absolutely key. If, if, if security can be provided, most of these problems can be solved. People know where they came from. They know who owned what piece of land. Um, and, 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 and they can survive even without aid. I mean, if, 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 if security were provided and aid were cut off, mm -hmm. that would be a, a tremendous improvement in, 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 in the lives of people. And of course, I'm not advocating cutting off aid. I'm just trying to weigh the, um, the, the, the relative weight of, of, of the two. And we must bear in mind that um, when we talk about the, the, the groups involved in this, um, the the, the, the militias responsible for this are overwhelmingly drawn from certain of the Arab groups in Darfur, but m the majority of the Arab groups in Darfur are actually not involved. They're actually neutral in this. And there's a, a tremendous resource there, for example, in, 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 in the largest of the Arab tribes of, of Darfur, the Rizigat of the south, whose leaders have very studiously under immense pressure stay out of this conflict and are constantly offering their services very discreetly, very quietly, to mediate. And, and, and they're saying we can, we, if the space is provided, we can we can do a tremendous job of putting this back together. The government won't permit it, and clearly, um, a, along with providing the security, as it were, at a village level, whereby ordinary people can get back on with their lives, apply the skills that they have for surviving. Um, there is also the need for removing that um, prohibition on the communities themselves beginning to sort that out. Because well, as they do that, the criminals will become a much weaker and much more marginal force. As there is this ongoing search for a resolution, um, I'm wondering, does it make a difference in terms of why it's happening? In other words, some have suggested this is a policy of deliberate Arabization 
of the Darfur region by the <coughs> government. Others say no, it's simply the consequences of uh, an ineffectual and, and weak government in, in Khartoum. Uh, how does that play into it? I would, I would say it's, it, it's, it's more miscalculation than, 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 than deliberate Arabization. I mean, there, there, there has been a deliberate policy of Islamization and Arabization in the South. Darfur is 100% Muslim. And the, traditionally, the, 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 the Arab elites, Arab has two senses. It's very important to recognize Arab means two rather different things. It means the cultural Arabs. Uh, who, who, who have affinities with Cairo, with the um, Nile Valley, with the Arabian Peninsula. And Arab means nomad, Bedouin. And the Arabs of Darfur are black, African, Muslim, indigenous Bedouins who have historically been subject to the same process of cultural, political Arabization as the non-Arabs. And, and, and they've been discriminated against historically just as much as the non-Arabs of, of Darfur. Um, so, and, and, but what has been happening is some of their leaders have been trying to seize upon this Arab identity as a ticket to emancipation and to power in the rest of Sudan. So the, it, it, it's not, there's no blueprint for Arabization coming out of Khartoum. There are some Arab supremacists amongst these uh, mobilized Bedouin Janjaweed who would love to see an, an Arab region. But, but um, theirs is not the same project uh, as the government. They have a, a, a merely a, a tactical alliance. And, and, and the tactical alliance that came about in the, in the heat of this insurgency that was very threatening to the government and unleashed um, this habitual counterinsurgency that is tantamount to genocide. I mean, I, I, I think um, Eric made the point about the, the, the clear genocidal intent in the government. In a, in, in a way, the government has got, got so habituated to to, to taking violence to this extreme that we don't even need to seek for intent. That's just how they do business. And, and, and in a sense, this is what has happened in, in, in Darfur. So we don't need to look deeply for blueprints for Arabization. This is just how they conduct warfare. I, I think Alex is exactly right. In fact, he wrote quite eloquently in the August issue of the London um, Review of Books that this is um, not the ideological uh, jihad against the Nuba people uh, that began in 1992 or even the instrumental clearances in the southern oil regions, but rather this is, I think he said, uh, the routine cruelty of a security cabal. It's humanity withered by years in power. It is genocide by force of habit. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing genocide by force of habit. I think that raises the question, though, if this is indeed a serially genocidal regime, what kind of peace can ever come to Sudan if this regime remains the dominant political force in Khartoum? That's the big question. Indeed. Yes. Hi. Um, first of all, hi to Bill and, and hi to Gloria. Hi, Jim. I know both of them. Um, I'm Jim Moore, and uh, for the last four years, I was a fellow at Harvard Law School and worked on uh, technology and, and international development and um, kind of understanding how societies change. And um, with friends of, of, of mine have, uh, have been writing this blog called Passion of the Present since last spring, which focuses on this. And so in that capacity, I've spent... I don't know, upwards of three to five hours a day kind of reading about this uh, since last spring. So I come at it as an amateur, but now as somebody who's looked at it for a long time. And, and what I conclude after this many months of looking at it is that the Chinese issue is really, really serious, and that is really the fundamental thing here. And then in some ways we divert ourselves by, by trying to understand what's going on in Sudan from, from, the, from really the Chinese issue here. This is a Chinese client state. Uh, the Chinese have gone from a net uh, exporter of oil to a net importer of oil over the last four years. Uh, they are now, as Eric says, and I want to sort of reinforce what Eric said and also what, what Bill said about this, the Chinese have gone uh, from an exporter of oil to an importer of oil. Uh, Sudan is their success story for establishing an oil base and a, and a way to bring in oil. Um, it is also their oil services base for the rest of Africa. And I'd like to add one other thing, which is that since... 9-11, uh, and since our invasion of Iraq, the Chinese have systematically gone around the world talking with regimes like the one in Sudan, Burundi would be an example, and the Saudis is another example, and saying, you know, if long-term you think it's difficult to sell oil to the United States, if long-term you're worried about how the United States is treating you and about the United States' concern for human rights, we're your guy. I mean, we, we are, we're willing to buy your oil, we're willing to invest, we have two national petroleum companies which are willing to come in and, and work with you, 
Uh, and, and so my question is, how do we deal with this? Because I think there, if, if you buy that, and particularly I think maybe Bill and, and Eric may buy this, if you buy that, that, that much of this is basically a Chinese support for a regime like Burma and others that they support, uh, where, where they care more about stability than anything else and they will keep these guys in power, how do you deal with this? I mean, what do, what do we do about that? <laughs> Good luck. Well, I, I, Sorry. Think first, <laughs> I think first we need to recognize the problem. I think part of the difficulty has been that uh, few have understood how deeply concerned China is about Sudan and how willing it is to go to the mat to preserve uh, its proprietary interests in the concessions. It is the dominant participant in oil production in both western and eastern Upper Nile in all the most promising areas. Um, uh, and I think we also, I must say, should be watching how China performs in other um, African countries, other developing economies, where their human rights uh, concerns do not exist. In fact, many have said that the Chinese are content with the present no war, no peace state in southern Sudan because it keeps the Western players out, keeps Total Fina Elf mm -hmm. out, it keeps right. everybody else out because nobody can tolerate national workers coming back in body bags. The Chinese can tolerate it easily. They don't like it, but they can tolerate it. Until we get serious about seeing how ruthless China is on the international stage in responding uh, to its oil needs in places like Sudan, we're going to have a tough time getting beyond uh, the weakest of Security Council resolutions, certainly as directed against Sudan. Yeah. In the interest of time, I think we need to move on. Sure. Thank you. Another question? Uh, yes, hi. My name is Jesse Sage. I'm with the American Anti-Slavery Group, and I want to start by thanking all of you for your incredible work, for going on the ground in many cases, and for Eric for uh, years of real leadership on Sudan. And I actually want to apologize on behalf of all of us, because I think the American people, while we, we've done some good stuff, we've largely failed. Uh, we have not taken to the streets on this genocide. Uh, and we have taken to the streets on other issues very recently. And um, so my first thing I want to say to, to the whole audience is that if you'd like to take a stand tomorrow on the steps of the State House here in Massachusetts, uh, we, along with many other student groups, including high school students, uh, students at Harvard, BU, and Tufts, have a candlelight vigil for International Human Rights Day, <coughs> calling on our own leaders in America and international leaders to act. And I think when Americans take to the streets, our leaders are much more likely to respond than if we simply publish reports or write op-eds, not that those aren't extremely important. So if you want to do something, come on out, and I can tell you that there's going to be uh, someone from John Kerry's office who's coming, Barney Frank sent a statement of support, and uh, it looks like one of the state senators from Massachusetts may be beginning to endorse a divestment campaign because uh, Massachusetts employees, their retirement fund has $1.4 billion roughly invested in companies doing business in Sudan. So I want people to know you can come out at 5.30 to the State House steps and take a little stand and light a candle. Also, there'll be a survivor of slavery, and I think it's important to hear from all of you, but also from Sudanese themselves. But I have uh, two questions, and they're both directed at Eric. Uh, the first, Eric, is uh, we hear some, uh, some uh, sentiment that we should um, relegate the Sudanese to live under the dictatorship that rules Sudan, uh, maybe in part because the Europeans aren't going to step up because they're upset about American policy, and I'm not sure we need to accept that European uh, abdication. But in any case, we, in America, we talk a lot about George Bush's America. So I wonder if you can tell us who is General Omar al-Bashir and what is his dictatorship like? And the second question I wanted to ask you is, um, you've been very active in the past on divestment. Uh, we successfully got talisman out of Sudan. Do you see uh, some success in pressuring uh, international, multinational corporations, including PetroChina, the Chinese uh, oil company, uh, through divestment? Will that make any difference? Thank you, and I'll, I'll try and answer as efficiently as I can. Um, in fact, to anatomize uh, the National Islamic Front regime, which is essentially unchanged since it took power by military coup in 1989, deposing elected government and aborting Sudan's most promising chance for peace since 1956, it's essentially unchanged. Uh, there are some who see moderation. I see simply a different kind of pragmatism. Uh, the, the ways in which powers shift within the National Islamic Front are exceedingly complex, an arcane matter. 
I suspect Alex and I could go on for many days debating about who's in, who's out, what coalitions there are. But I don't think it's Omar Bashir's government. I think the most powerful man in Sudan is First Vice President Ali Osman Taha. That's important because of his role in Naivasha. If we see a peace agreement actually take hold in Naivasha, then we will know something very important about a collective decision on the part of the National Islamic Front. On the question of divestment, there is a booming divestment campaign uh, focused in part in Harvard uh, on shares of PetroChina, the dominant uh, uh, part of the dominant uh, uh, Chinese oil presence in southern Sudan. But there are also a great many other Asian and European companies held widely in American portfolios that are supporting this regime. I, I, and I think this is a regime that cannot survive and produce a just peace in Sudan. So I urge you to look at a website, www.divestsudan.org, and learn just about how your own monies are invested in companies that have chosen, I believe, myopically, to in invest in the survival of a regime that could not survive without that investment. Its external debt is $22 billion on a per capita basis. Sudan has probably got the most indebted economy in the world. And let me just add that this is a fragile government. I mean, we, we, it's a dictatorship, yes, but there were two coup attempts in the, in the eight days that we were in Sudan, and there have been God knows how many other coup attempts. Uh, and this is a divided government. It's a confused government. And uh, as, as Eric has just said, it's divided from the top on down as well. I, I would actually disagree that it hasn't changed. I, I, I think that in, in the first years in power, in the, particularly the, the, the first six, seven years after the coup of 1989, it had an ideological ambition for really transforming Sudan into an Islamic state and exporting that revolution to its neighbors. And that project failed. And it failed not because of the U.S. opposition. It failed because of opposition in Sudan and, and, and in the region. And that led to the Islamic movement splitting. And what we have now are, are, is, is, is in, in power is one wing of that, which in, is less ideologically ambitious, <clears throat> but arguably more militarized and, 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 and with, with its claws into the security apparatus, um, more pragmatic. And one of the ironies <clears throat> about the war in Darfur is that one of the rebel groups is drawn from the, the other, the more militant, the more ideological wing of, 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 of that movement. And, 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 and that movement is still there, um, and, the, the, and, and its leader is Hassan al-Turabi, who was the, the sheikh of the Sudanese Islamists. And, and my great fear about the, the call for regime change is that that movement, which is um, very similar in most respects to those who are in power, they are the people who are, who are most likely to take over if, if, if this government falls, and that would not be an improvement. Uh, with the exception of Mr. DeWalt, I think some of you have shed a lot more heat than light on this subject tonight. Uh, it's been noted, of course, that uh, the European uh, Union is largely skeptical of the claim of genocide. Uh, you may also realize that the African Union is also a little skeptical of that. Uh, at the same time, in September, when Colin Powell uh, was calling it genocide, uh, President Obasanjo of Nigeria was appearing at the United Nations, and he made the following comments. He said that uh, before you can say that this is genocide or ethnic cleansing, uh, we will have to have a definite decision and plan and program of a government to wipe out a particular group of people. Then we will be talking about genocide ethnic or ethnic cleansing. What we know is not that. What we know is that there was an uprising, rebellion, and the government armed another group of people to stop that rebellion. That's what we know. That doesn't amount to genocide from our own reckoning. It amounts to, of course, conflict. There is a human crisis there, but no one has really proven that it's genocide. Uh, the other word besides genocide that keeps coming up is the word Arab. And there seems to be an attempt to link uh, Arab with genocide. And that may be uh, another political ulterior motive. Uh, Mr. DeWalt has drawn a distinction, a very important one, between being a political cultural Arab and between an ethnic uh, and uh, racial Arab, uh, which uh, most of the Sudanese uh, are not. Now. The United States, of course, turned a blind eye and was oblivious to what happened in Rwanda, in Uganda, in Congo, where there were perhaps four million people killed. All of those governments are on board in the so-called U.S. war on terrorism. But can the United States now see this as a strategic opportunity 
to draw a line between Arab and African countries and bring Africa on board in its so-called war on terrorism. I can't speak for the U.S. government's assessment of genocide. Uh, I can speak uh, to the assessment from the human rights community. And it is based on um, a very informed reading of the Genocide Convention that uh, the President of Nigeria um, has uh, not engaged in. The Genocide Convention um, and the legal judgment that have come out of the recent war crimes tribunals in Rwanda and Yugoslavia uh, is viewed as a living document that requires the signatory states to intervene to try to prevent the crime of genocide if they see it unfolding. And for that to be able to happen, to, to operationalize the convention, requires being able to look over the boundary of an oppressive or failing state where it's impossible to get a contemporaneous sense of intent based on documentary evidence or testimonials or a juridical process, mm -hmm. to look over the boundaries and identify patterns of death and patterns of attack, and on that basis infer intent. And this has been judged to be the proper reading of the Genocide Convention by the justices, the tribunals for Rwanda and Yugoslavia. Further, the notion of the ethnic division, what group is it that is being attacked by what group, is definitely contested. I agree with you. It is not at all clear. But it is not on the attempt to mark a divide between Arab and African that those of us are looking at this so closely. We are, again, taking up the judgment in Yugoslavia and in Rwanda to say that when members of one group know that they belong to that group, and they can look across and say, members of that group are after me, and reciprocally that group define themselves as a group as opposed to another group. The internal recognition of difference can be very fine and very fine-grained. And I can tell you from having talked to people up and down the corridor of the Chad side of the border where there are infiltrations, but also much more safety to talk about what they really feel is going on, to a man and to a woman, they say we are attacked because we are black African. It has nothing to do with color, as Alex has said. You can't tell the difference. It has a lot to do with culture, and that has to do with whether you come from an African tribe, whether you speak an African language as your first language, or whether you are identified with Khartoum and the Arab Peninsula and you speak Arabic as your first language. And the people we talked to in Chad who were refugees said they could tell by looking at the way people rode a saddle, by the way their language, their accent was, by the way they dressed, by what their customs were, what side of the divide they were on. So I, I do think that there is granted a subtle but definitely a real division between and among these people that is being exacerbated by this conflict, totally being exacerbated, exacerbated and manipulated. And it is a dangerous, dangerous concept to continue to employ as a means of dividing what's happening in North Africa and the Sahel. But that's entirely why we need to call it for what we see it is and to implore and press for nation states and international institutions to stop it. Yes, but there are many other situations sorry, like in Palestine sorry, and Colombia and elsewhere where we have here. We're, more we're over refugees time as it is, but thank you. that aren't attended to in the same way that it is in America for those reasons. If I might add one comment. <clears throat> Mukesh Kapila, no apologist for American policy, who was in Rwanda during the genocide, said in March of this year, and I quote, there is no difference now between Darfur and Rwanda except for the numbers. He went on to intimate that he saw all the ways in which the numbers could climb to the levels to which they have now. Uh, I, I would strongly urge that um, our last questioner look at data from the Coalition for International Justice, reports by Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the International Crisis Group, before returning or, or resorting to the uh, opinions and assessment of President Obasanjo. Um, may I make one very brief uh, comment, which is, Personally, I, 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 I think it, what's happening in Darfur meets the, 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 the criteria for genocide. What I think is very unfortunate is the way that it has been, ha the, the genocide determination and the language around it has been handled as it, in such a way that it appears from the viewpoint of the Arab world to be a unilateral U.S. determination that demonizes Arabs. 
and it and it has it carries with it the implication that Arabs collectively are beyond the moral pale, and that is the way it's being read in Khartoum, and that has allowed the Sudan government to construct an alliance of solidarity across the Arab world with governments that, in other circumstances, ought to be um, ought, ought to be on our side, if you like, and and I think that the way that issue has been mishandled is is very significant. Uh, regretfully, we have time for only one more question. If you can make it fast, I'd appreciate oh. it. Uh, hello, esteemed panel. Um, my name is Matt Linton. Uh, it's become obvious to the citizens of the United States because of the Afghanistan conflict that refugees can put a huge um, burden upon a government economically. Um, can the further displacement of people in countries such as Chad, in Ethiopia, in the Congo, places like that, could it possibly destabilize the region because of the economic burden of those people? Uh, that, that's an especially good question. There are presently over 200,000 refugees in Chad. The UN High Commission for Refugees estimates that between 100 and 200,000 Darfuris are poised very close to the border to flee into Chad. There are already violent disputes over the very scarce resources on that, in that part of Chad, arable land, pasturage, water. I think if we see another 200,000 refugees flee to Chad, we will have the formula for an absolutely massive humanitarian disaster. And we are also already seeing violence within the camps themselves. People are not 200,000 in Chad, 1.2 million or however many in Darfur. People are not going to sit forever in the conditions in which they're living without, uh, without some response. Um, may I make one point, which is... There's also a very serious danger if we look the other way. Um, there, for historic reasons, there are probably in the region of one to one and a half million uh, people who originate in Darfur in central Sudan, central and eastern Sudan, who migrated there over generations often. These people are desperately exposed. Uh, they are intermingled with the, the regular population. Um, they, they are at the bottom of the economic heap. If the government... Uh, for whatever reason, panic or deliberate plan decides to take this a stage further, that's the place to watch for um, really, really serious abuses. And for the several more who I know wanted to ask a question, unfortunately we didn't have time to do that. My guess is if you came down right after we finish, uh, perhaps you can get a personal answer. So thank you all. John Chad. Thank you. <laughs> I think you, you would agree with me that uh, we have covered an extraordinary amount of territory in an hour and a half, and I, I'm extremely grateful to our panel, both for their discipline in keeping their answers and their points relatively concise, uh, and, for, and above all for their extraordinary knowledge and commitment to this, ex this terrible issue that we've been exploring here. And uh, on behalf of uh, the Kennedy Library Foundation and Amnesty International, uh, Northeast Regional Office, Josh Rubenstein, uh, the director, is here. Um, I want to thank uh, Bill Schultz, Gloria White-Hammond, and Eric Reeves, Jennifer Leaning, Alex DeWall, and thank you very much, Gail Harris, for such a great moderating job. Thank you all.